Hello, today I'm going to forge a knife out of this coil spring. It's not something I do a whole lot of. I mean, I appreciate the whole reclaiming steel thing, and I do some of that. I make some artistic knives, obviously, out of a lot of different stuff. But this is going to be a functional knife, and I think when you're doing that, especially for a customer, scrap is probably not the way to go. You just don't know where it's been or what it's been through, if it's got stress fractures, nor do you know exactly how to heat treat it in a lot of cases. Surely this is 5160 or something like it, some sort of spring steel, and we should do just fine. We'll check it out and make sure we can heat treat it effectively in just a minute, but you're never going to get a maximally efficient heat treat with the steel when, that you don't know exactly what it is. After I straighten it out, I'm going to clean it up and then etch it in ferric chloride just, just to see what it looks like, make sure that I don't see any obvious stress fractures in that way. I've heard that that's uh, one method for picking up some issues with steel. So what else is new? I usually type up a script for these things or take some notes or something so I can hit all the points that I want to, but I didn't do that today. So it's just me, a microphone, and whatever noises I make in the next 22 minutes and I apologize for that. So that's the ferric chloride that I was talking about. I'm rubbing on there to do a light etch and see if anything jumps out. By the way, this is the only other integral I've ever made. So this will be a learning experience. Like I said, I don't know exactly what type of steel this is. It should be 5160 or something like it, some sort of spring steel with similar alloying to that. So this is Texaco A quench oil. As you can see, I don't forge 5160 a whole lot, but it should make this steel nice and hard. So we're just gonna test it though and make sure that we can in fact heat treat this somewhat effectively, at least to make it hard. Skates that file, that's a good sign. Looks like it's past my rigorous quality standards. So the goal here, at least when I start out, is I'm thinking about a burden trout knife or something, you know, thin and small and sort of sleek. There's obviously not a lot of steel here to make a, a, a wide type of blade or, you know, a bowie knife or anything like that. You can probably tell I don't work with a lot of round stock. I could probably use to improve this technique. I'm not sure I did this very efficiently, but. The blade of the knife's been isolated. I'm going to try to draw it out, you know, make it wider with a cross peen here in a second.
Yep, yep. I'm forging in shorts. I understand the risks. It's not it's not a good deal. I don't recommend it. The metal flakes fall off the anvil or fly off the anvil. They're very hot. They burn right through your socks when they get down in your shoes and will leave scars on your feet. I have some. But it's just too hot in my garage, so it's a risk I choose to take. I've seen some other guys do it. It's not smart, to be honest. The main issue here, of course, is that the piece you're working on will flip away from the anvil, as it does sometimes with all of us. Sometimes we lose our grip. And if it whips across your legs, for example, the, a piece of metal that hot, that big, will burn you severely, very, very quickly. This is a cool trick. I'm whipping the spine of the knife against the top of the anvil and it straightens it out. I learned this watching an American Bladesmith Society video on forging knives. I don't remember which smith was doing it, but it's a pretty cool trick. We've moved on to trying to isolate the tang. The blade is pretty much done. Here's a problem. My filing jig doesn't open wide enough to accommodate the integral handle. So I had to rig it with some C clamps and that nut you can see there in between. And it's just not perfectly flat all the way around. As a result, there was some wobbling. So at any rate, I, it's not going to butt up against a handle, whatever my handle material is perfectly flat. Here I'm doing some thermal cycling and then I'm going to quench it in that Texaco A slow oil and I tempered this at 390 degrees twice for an hour and a half each. So back to the issue with the integral. I did try filing that area straight so that it would meet up perfectly flush all the way around with the handle material or the, whatever spacer I was going to use. But as soon as I got one area flat, I would just open up another area gap somewhere else. So I just I was chasing my tail with the file and basically I decided on on a different sort of fix. I'll show you what I did in a minute. Got nice and hard. I've scribed a line down the center of the knife all the way from tip to stern. And I'm going to use that as a guide while I'm grinding. I need to keep everything perfectly straight here. I've sort of taken more recently to doing my quenching and heat treating very early in the process before I do much of any grinding. And the reason is that I hate warps. I just haven't nailed down all my thermal cycling. I'm trying some new things right now as far as that goes to prevent some warping. But grinding is the number one way you're going to introduce warping into your quench process. Just you know, a divot here or there or uneven grinding on one side versus the other. And I've spent an entire day chasing warps, like on a chef knife, for example, that I made recently. You can see I got this blade geometry down very thin. The spine is still a little bit thick, but the edge is right down to almost zero. So.
All right, here's my handle material. I'm going to drill my initial hole here, and then I'll file out that to fit the tang a little tighter. I'm going to have to open it up a little bit, but not too much. The tang is sort of narrow. This is going to be a threaded tang. So there's going to be a screw that goes on that to pin the handle in place. I said I had a creative solution to those gaps around the guard, and this is it. I'm going to use leather and brass. The leather should definitely compress up and fill in any of those tiny gaps. Pretty clever. And by the way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this for this reason on an actual customer knife. This is not a customer knife, and I would, you know, if I were to do it for a customer knife, it would be disclosed. You know, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to cheat anybody. <laughs> it's not. It's not something I regard as quality work. Uh, I would really want to fix that so it's flush on its own with a harder space of material, normally. But this is uh, no one's knife but mine, and so I'm just going to fix it how I fix it. I've drawn out and measured, and now I'm making sure that my drill bit follows the line that's needed to get the back of the. Uh, handle drilled out and you can see the hole goes through very nicely and that'll be where our threaded tang sits. This is some mild steel round stock from Home Depot. And it, for round stock, it's not very round, I gotta say. <laughs> it's 5 16 and sort of wobbly. But I am gonna measure it halfway and then mark up where I think the center is. We'll use an optical center punch to, to punch in a, a hole for us to start our drill. My drill bit still chatters and still wanders a little bit despite this marking. So actually making this, getting this center despite a good punch is actually not very easy. So the only way this is going to actually keep the handle in place to the tang and cinch it up would be if there's a step off right. So I have to grind in a step off here with a shoulder. The stock is 5 16 at its native diameter. The hole in the back of the handle right now is a quarter inch. So I'm going to get this threaded area down to a quarter inch and we'll let the 5 16 cinch everything up. So I'll drill a second sort of step off hole in the back of the handle at 5 16 and this thing will just fit in there and thread right on the pommel if everything goes right. So that's the idea. Here's the 5 16 hole going in the back of the handle. So we've got a nice little ledge there. This is 30 minute epoxy with graphite in it to make it black. Everything dry fits well. I don't see any gaps. I wouldn't put the handle together knowing that there are gaps, but just in case, because I can't see in between the leather and the brass perfectly in the, in the handle area, it'll be black. 
the leather is going to be dyed black so if there is a problem it won't be all that visible and again this is because the the integral area where I used my filing jig is not perfectly flat or straight all the way around so this is not something you know I wouldn't rely on epoxy to fill a gap in a customer knife this is just this is going to be my knife I understand what's wrong with it and that so on and so forth you guys get me I cut a little groove in the back of our pin so I can can screw it on So the handle wasn't bedded, right? I didn't, you know, bed the epoxy in there, and I can't take the handle off and on because I don't really need to. It's an integral handle. There's no guard to work around. It's not a complex shaped handle. It's a bunch of straight lines, and I really feel like I can grind it safely without damaging the knife while it's attached and glued up, and that that's not going to be a big deal. If there were facets and it was a complex shape handle or a guard that uh, I couldn't, you know, grind right up against. Then you'd have to bed this handle, you know, take it off, grind it, put it back on for fit, take it off, put it back on, so on and so forth. I just don't have to do that here. So it's already glued up prior to sanding or shaping. By the way, this handle is a redwood burl. I've got it clamped up here in horse stall mat, which is a trick you guys have seen me use before. I think I really like that for clamping stuff better than leather and towels and stuff. This is going to be sharpened on these Arkansas stones. I'm going to take it to an ultra fine level on the Arkansas stone. That's that black stone in the back. And then I'll go to Shapton glass and I'll try to take it up to 16,000 grit. And then I've got some 0.5 micron drop stuff that I'll probably use. So even though the edge is fine, the spine of the knife is still a bit thick, especially for a bird and trout knife. It could probably be a 32nd or a 16th thinner, I think. So the, it's not a very perfect kitchen geometry knife, although it should do fairly well. The problem here is this tomato is bred to be knife proof. This is an extra tough uh, breed. No, I have, a bur <laughs> I have a burr on the knife. I'm going to have to strap it off here in a second and we'll see if it does any better. All right, so I've gone back and I've stropped it off. Main hang up here are my knife skills. Now this will shave my face. Like I shaved my face with this knife at this point. I took a video of it, but I was just never going to see the light of day <laughs> when I was editing. There's like spit strings hanging out of my mouth and uh, tomato sauce and like something in my teeth. My face was not you know, camera ready for that whole experience. But it did, honestly, it does shave my face. Paper's not my favorite test. I think I've said that before. Just because you can, you can bias the test by, you know, tilting the paper or holding it a certain way or angling the knife or not angling the knife, whatever, whatever, you know, pulling or pushing the knife at different times. This will push cut a loop. The loop has to bend a little bit first, but, it, you know, it's still pretty sharp. It doesn't do a perfect job of that, but. And it'll pull cut a loop very easily. Paper hates him. Arm hairs hate him. Well, there it is. I like it. I don't know what it is, if it's a paring knife or a bird and trout small game knife. I don't know, but I like it. I wish that the integral portion had been much smoother and I'd really nailed down that filing jig problem, but it is what it is. What do you guys think? 